Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, uh, happy whatever day it is you are watching this. Welcome to the left side of the aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me that I think are worthy of your attention. As always, any comments, questions, whatever, uh, should be sent to me directly. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And I never think you catch that on the fly, so my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be around here somewhere uh, a couple of times during the show. You can go there, get the, get the email address from there. I do answer my email. I just ask that if you um, send me email, please put something like, uh, your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that uh, in the subject line so I know it's not spam. All right, I got a whole bunch of things to get to today. Uh, a lot of it are, these are follow-ups of things that I have talked about before where there's been some development worthy of your note. Um, the first thing, last week, last week in, uh, in Outrage of the Week, I went after the uh, Department of Justice for its decision to not prosecute Goldman Sachs, despite the clear evidence of massive fraud committed by the firm. I also said, I'm going to quote myself here, the agency, that's the DOJ, did grandly allow as to how it would take another look if new information came to light. That is, if someone else would do all the work of investigation and uh, research and drop an airtight case into its lap, so such a loud plop that it couldn't be ignored. Well, it turns out I wasn't the only one thinking that. The same day that I recorded that, uh, Matt Taibbi uh, wrote at his, on his blog at uh, Rolling Stone magazine that Attorney General Eric Holder has no balls. He wrote, quote, our prosecutors and regulators have basically admitted now that they only go after the most obvious and easily prosecutable cases. The only white collar cases they will bring are absolute slam dunks. And it's because especially Goldman Sachs is not the only recent example of this. The DOJ is apparently going to end what it called an investigation of uh, MF Global without filing any criminal charges. Now, MF Global uh, is, or, well, it was, it's bankrupt now, so it, it was, uh, a brokerage and commodities firm that had been run by former New Jersey Governor John Corzine. The company lost money, and... I don't mean it lost money on bad deals. I don't mean it lost money because the stock market turned down or something. I mean lost as in just can't find. They lost $1.6 billion in customer funds. Now, the charge was that the money was actually stolen from customer funds to give to J.P. Morgan Chase in order to cover up MF Global's losses. But doggone it, our Justice Department just finds a case like that just too darn hard to try to prosecute. Instead, it concluded that, quoting, chaos and porous risk controls at the firm, rather than fraud, allowed the money to disappear. <laughs> so I guess that's all right then, that all those people lost, the, lost that money. It wasn't fraud, it was just complete incompetence. I feel much better now. On a somewhat more positive note, I told you a few weeks ago about the scandal around LIBOR. Uh, this is the London Interbank Offered or Offering Rate. Now, just a quick refresher. LIBOR is a daily interest rate that is set based on information from a group of international banks about what interest rates they would pay on short-term loans from each other. The importance of LIBOR is that the interest rate that it sets affects literally trillions of dollars in uh, financial transactions around the world. And there is clear evidence, in fact, including a confession from one of the banks involved, that that rate has been manipulated for those banks' short-term gain. Well, the good news on this is that over the past few weeks, uh, the attorneys general of New York and Connecticut have issued subpoenas to seven banks over the scandal. Subpoenas were issued to Barclays, Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, HSBC, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and UBS. Now, we're still waiting to see what the Federal Department of Justice will do, but based on prior experience, don't expect too much. 
All right, here's something else. I mentioned about this last week, uh, about the case in Pennsylvania challenging the voter ID law in that state. I said that a decision on that uh, request for an injunction against the law was expected soon. Turns out it happened the afternoon that I recorded that. So it was actually a whole week ago now this was done. Well, Commonwealth Court Judge Robert Simpson denied the injunction. Uh, He said that the requirements of voter ID were not overly burdensome. He wrote, photo ID is a reasonable, non-discriminatory, non-severe burden when viewed in the broader context of the widespread use of photo ID in daily life. In other words, he's one of those people that can't get it through their heads that not everybody has a photo ID and not everybody commonly goes on a plane or checks into a motel or even drives, especially in cities. Um... He also said, and this really struck me, he said that the law failed to establish that disenfranchisement was immediate or inevitable, and the law does not expressly disenfranchise or burden any qualified elector or group of electors. In other words, he's saying the law does not specifically say this is intended to make it harder for poor people to vote. It does not specifically say we don't want elderly people voting. And because it doesn't expressly disenfranchise, there's no problem with it. In fact, here's here's something else about this. He noted that the law already allows for absentee ballots and suggested that uh, some of these some of the plaintiffs in the case uh, could actually get absentee ballots. On the same day, the same day that he cleared the path for this law to go to, uh, to for the for the go uh, go into effect the state government of Pennsylvania the administration of uh, I think his first name is Tom Corbett governor Tom Corbett the same day he announced this uh, the state abandoned plans to make it easier for people to get absentee ballots but no there's no intention to impact voting rights here I'll be talking a lot more about this in the future All right, moving on to another thing, Uh, another update. It was some time back that I spoke about Arizona's notorious Papers, Please law. In June, the Supreme Court struck down most of this law, uh, leaving intact only the provision that police may check the immigration status of someone during a lawful arrest. Uh, And in fact, even that part of the law is now subject to a separate constitutional challenge in court. I bring this up because in the course of the debate about this bill, it was said by opponents that the law was driven more, uh, was driven less rather by concern over immigration than by the color of the skin of those immigrants. Supporters of the law, of course, vociferously deny this, but their repeated references to sealing and protecting the border made it kind of hard to take that at face value. But the thing is, Now, we have proof that this law, that the driving force behind this law was, well, the polite term is racially motivated. The more accurate term is racist. The main sponsor and the main force behind this bill was a guy named Russell Pierce. He was the president of the Arizona State Senate. He's a real right winger, no surprise there. Uh, And actually, by the way, he later got kicked out of office in a recall election, partly because of this. But the ACLU of Arizona recently obtained thousands of emails Pierce sent, official emails he sent, during his time as Senate president. And they make absolutely clear the attitude that was driving his efforts. Here's a sample of what the emails showed. These are quotes from Pierce from his own emails, okay? Last week, Denver's illegal aliens sang our national anthem in Spanish and bastardizes the words of our, in all caps, our country's most sacred song. Battles commence as Mexican nationalists struggle to infuse their men into American government and strengthen control over their strongholds. One look at Los Angeles with its Mexican-American mayor shows you Vincente Fox's General Varagosa commanding an American city. Vincente Fox is the president of Mexico. Varagosa is the mayor of Los Angeles. Corruption is the mechanism by which Mexico operates. Its people spawn more corruption wherever they go because it's their only known way of life. Tough, nasty illegals and their advocates grow in such numbers that law and order will not subdue them. 
They run us out of our cities, out of our states. They conquer our language and our schools. They render havoc and chaos in our schools. We are much like the Titanic as we inbreed millions of Mexico's poor, the world's poor, and we watch our country sink. And maybe best of all was this. The new definition of racist is anyone winning an argument with a liberal, a minority, a pacifist, Bible banger, or moron. That is the man who pushed this bill. When are we going to admit to ourselves that racism and bigotry are alive and, well, I don't want to say well because, in fact, it's a sickness, but they are alive and thriving in our society. And, in fact, they have been since the beginning. It hasn't just been, bigotry has not been just against blacks and Hispanics, in fact, they're just the latest target of this, of our isolationist xenophobia. We can trace it back generation by generation, group by group, target by target, Asians, Poles, Italians, Irish, Jews, Catholics. Every time there is a wave of immigrants uh, 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 that was in any way different bluntly, that wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Every time there was a wave of different people, we heard the same things. It's going to destroy the country, undermine these foreigners. They're dirty, they're filthy, they're all the rest of this nonsense. And we, we could trace this right back to, the, to Native Americans who weren't even immigrants. Our record on this is a shameful one. Now, maybe... Maybe it's, uh, uh, it, it may not be the worst. It may not even be particularly bad compared to other nations. That doesn't change the fact that it is shameful. All right, another update. Three weeks ago, I talked about James Holmes, who walked into a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and killed 12 people. Two weeks ago, I talked about Wade Michael Page, who walked into a Sikh temple in a suburb of, of Milwaukee, and when that was over, seven people were dead, including Page himself. Now, I get to talk about Floyd Lee Corkins. On the morning of August 16th, he walked into the offices of the Right Wing Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. When he was challenged by a security guard, he pulled out a gun and shot the guard in the arm. Now, the guard despite being shot, actually was able to subdue, um, subdue Corkins. Um, and no one else was hurt. No one else was killed. Or no one at all was killed, in fact. Um, although, you know, we have to say that we don't know what would have happened if Corkins had not been challenged. All right, three incidents, three cases of guns, three cases of bloodshed. However, there was one difference worth pointing out. When Holmes went on his rampage, the right-wing gun nuts all immediately, almost like in unison, started shouting, Lone Wacko! No connection to anything else. No connection at all to anything else. When Page shot down peaceful worshipers, again, we got Lone Wacko. This is despite the fact that Page had been in the white power uh, music scene for over 10 years before this, but still, oh no, no connection to that. No connection, he's a Lone Wacko. No connection to this. Domestic terrorism, don't be absurd. Lone Wacko. Now we have Corkins. He supposedly told the guard, I don't like your politics, before he shot him, and was described as his, by his parents as having, I'm quoting here, strong opinions with respect to those he believes do not treat homosexuals in a fair manner. In other words, unlike most shooters, he appears to have been coming from the left. So is he another lone wacko, according to the right wing? Of course not! He's not a lone wacko. No, he's a product of the left. Uh, the, the president of the Family Research Council, this idiot named Tony Perkins, he blamed the Southern Poverty Law Center for the shooting. He said that the SPLC, which tracks hate groups like the Family Research Council, well, by calling these hate groups hate groups, he was actually, the group is actually giving people a license to take innocent life. So it's the SPLC's fault. The next day, Perkins added the Obama administration. It's the Obama administration's fault for the hostile atmosphere they've created by their hostility to freedom of religion. So when it's a right-winger, oh, it's a lone wacko. When it's somebody from the left, the entire left half of the political spectrum is respons responsible. All right, look, I'm going to take a break there. I've got more stuff to talk about, a couple of more updates, so we'll get back to you in just a couple of minutes.
And we're back, we're back. Um, one more update for you. Uh, back around the beginning of the year, I warned you about the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. I say warned because this bill includes a provision, section 1022 to be exact, that would grant the government the power to have the military imprison people indefinitely without trial or even charge based solely on the president's decision that you are a suspected terrorist or substantially supporting some terrorist or associated group. This would even include U.S. citizens taken on U.S. soil. Now, on May 16th, federal judge Catherine Forrest found the laws unconstitutional, violates the rights of free speech and due process. She did so, uh, as, I, as I said last time we're talking about this, she did it after a Ka Kafka-esque hearing in which lawyers for the government repeatedly refused to explain what the laws and possibly vague terms like associated forces and substantial support actually mean. Uh, the government actually instead tried to argue that these seven plaintiffs in the case do not have standing to sue. That is, they couldn't sue because the law hadn't affected them. More precisely, the government is arguing they couldn't sue because they had not been indefinitely detained, which means by the government's argument, the only people who can sue would be the people who would be beyond the reach of the courts. Catch-22 mean anything? In issuing her ruling, Judge Forrest said she was worried by the government's reluctance to say whether the examples of the plaintiff's activities that they cited, such as supporting WikiLeaks, would fall under the scope of this provision of the law. Well, okay. A couple of weeks ago, the feds were back in court. They are appealing Judge Forrest's uh, decision uh, at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, hilariously, it's really, uh, despite the government's failure to be able to define some basic central terms of the law, the government is arguing in its appeal that the law is neither broad nor vague. But here's something. Here's something that really got me. The appeal argues that the plaintiffs, now the plaintiffs in this case, they include academics, researchers, activists, there's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, there's actually a member of the Icelandic parliament. Um, that the, that the uh, plaintiffs cannot point, I'm quoting, the, I'm quoting the, 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 uh, the appeal here, the plaintiffs cannot point to a single example of the military's detaining anyone for engaging in conduct, conduct even remotely similar to the type of expressive activities they allege could lead to detention. Well, fine. Then say so. Say that those sorts of activities are not covered by the law. Say that there's no legal reason to be concerned. Say that's not what the law means. Just say that. But the fact is, they won't say that. They won't say that. They want this law to be broad. They want it to be vague. They want it to have as broad a brush as possible. They want this law. They want it in place. They want it in force. And they want it with no legal or constitutional restrictions as to its reach. We are in danger of becoming, in fact, we are already becoming, what I call a soft police state. And I do not use the term police state lightly. But by soft police state, what I mean is we have elections. We have campaigns. We have all the outward trappings of democracy. There is free speech, at least a form of it. There are what appear to be political debates. There are newspapers and magazines. There is the Internet. But ultimately... All of that is allowed. All of that is tolerated because dissent is ineffective. Because our dissents, all these outward appearances of democracy, of human rights, all of our dissents do not affect the positions and perks of the powerful. Because instead of being a, a means of change, our protests and position, uh, petitions and political campaigns are becoming more and more just a way to blow off steam a way to make us think that we have a role, think that we have a voice, think that we have some place in this, in this system without actually having one. Cross the line, actually impact the system, and the hammer comes down. That's why Occupy Wall Street was so threatening to our power elites, because it was having an impact. 
because it was getting people talking about things like income inequality, about the power of the 1%, that people actually is responding to this, affected to the point where the media and politicians actually had to respond to this. That's why the uh, Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street encampments across the country were hit with that wave of, of evictions, a wave of attacks across the country. All of these attacks following the same plan, using the same tactics, making the same bogus charges. It was because the Occupy movement could not be ignored and had to be shut down. Now, make no mistake, Occupy Wall Street is not dead. In fact, there's a, a photo I will bring up here that actually is, um, this is of a, a recent protest in Charlotte, North Carolina, about the uh, Bank of America. But there's no doubt that the movement was damaged, severely damaged by these attacks. And more importantly to the power elite, the movement has largely been forced back to the fringes. That is, it is now exists largely as a series of isolated individual local stories instead of a national one. So the result is the power elite has been able to go back to making its money and as a political issue, getting us to talk about what it wants us to talk about. Not income equality, no, none of that, but not social justice, not economic justice, but the deficit is what we have to talk about and why it means we should cut taxes. And remember, I didn't say the argument made sense, but why the deficit means we should cut taxes and slash Social Security and other social programs. Which brings us actually to the outrage of the week. This is not a, a present outrage, actually. It's sort of a possible future outrage, it relates to a present outrage. If Obama is reelected, there likely will be a shakeup in the cabinet. This is pretty normal uh, between the first and second terms of a, of a president. Uh, it's pretty normal for there to be some, you know, changes in personnel in the cabinet. Uh, one of the people expected to leave in the event of a second term is uh, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. And who is it that the D.C. media people, the ones with the access to the White House insiders, say is going to be tapped to replace Tim Geithner? Erskine Bowles. Name ring a bell? If not, how about the Simpson Bowles plan? Remember in the spring of 2010 when Obama appointed this commission to, uh, to develop a plan to cut the deficit and how the commission was dubbed the cat food commission because it was stacked with people who wanted to cut social programs? Um, and how in the commission couldn't agree? The co-chairs of the commission, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, issued their own report. Oh, yeah, 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 maybe a glimmer of recognition there, okay? Yeah, maybe you just remember this. Well, here's the point. That report, the Simpson-Bowles plan, had at a centerpiece cutting Social Security. Erskine Bowles has been campaigning to cut Social Security for 15 years. He perpetually sp spins the, the, the standard falsehoods about the financing, about how they're about to go under, about how it's terrible. We gotta, um, and now the word is that Barack Obama wants him to be the Secretary of the Treasury. When will the Obama bots get it through their thick skulls that Barack Obama wants to cut Social Security? He wants to cut Medicare. He wants to cut Medicaid. In fact, he's groused that he doesn't get enough credit for being so willing to cut them. All he wants in return for this is some token tax hike in the rich. This is the grand bargain that people keep talking about. Would Bowles get approved if nominated? Well, he's loved by the right wing, he's loved by Wall Street, and in fact, he once served on the board of directors of Morgan Stanley, so yes, he'd probably sail right through. Um, and uh, especially because these same forces are well aware of his desire to see the elderly sent back to picking through garbage in order to be able to survive. And if the word on the street is right, that's who Barack Obama wants to be the Secretary of the Treasury. And that is an outrage. All right, last thing on the menu today, uh, the Clara Bell Award. This again, given as necessary for acts of meritorious stupidity. This time the dishonoree is somebody I'm sure you've heard about unless you've been in a coma for the last uh, couple of weeks. 
On Sunday, August 19th, Representative Todd Aiken, a right-wing loon who's uh, actually the uh, Gopper nominee for the Senate in Missouri this year, uh, he's against allowing abortion even in the cases of rape, and he defended that position uh, by saying what he called, in cases of what he called legitimate rape, whatever that means, but in cases of legitimate rape, women don't get pregnant. That somehow their bodies block an unwanted pregnancy. Oh, it's really rare, he says. Now, lots of people, including even the Republican National Committee, uh, Senator Mitch Fishface McConnell, uh, even, even Witless Romney came down on him for that, saying he should quit the race. Some people said he should resign from office. But let's be fair. He's neither the first nor the only right-winger to have made this same claim. Uh, Rachel Maddow at MSNBC and Garance Frank Ruta at The Atlantic had citations of right-wingers saying this all the way from 1980 through 2010. You know, one argument, uh, one of these people they quoted, argued that pregnancy from rape was as rare as snowfall in Miami. Another said the odds against it were millions and millions to one. My favorite was that one of them said that in the event of rape, a woman's body secretes a certain secretion, which kills sperm. And I have to admit, I have to tell you, there have been physicians who have said that, that you can't get pregnant from non-consensual sex. There have been physicians who have said that. In the Middle Ages, they said that. In the real world, in the modern world, which people like Aikens apparently don't ever visit, we know that, in fact, that uh, tens of thousands of women get pregnant from rape every single year. And that's one thing about Aikens' statement. But there's another thing. There's another, another reason. I mean, this was hands down the stupidest thing I heard all week. But uh, the other reason uh, that I picked them was that he tried to weasel out of the meaning of his own words with that moldy, vapid, doesn't really mean anything, all-purpose excuse, I misspoke. Here's what he said, I'm quoting him. It's clear that I misspoke and it does not reflect the deep empathy I hold for the thousands of women who are raped and abused every year. Now note clearly he doesn't say his claim that women don't get pregnant from rape is wrong. So where did he misspeak? This is his actual original quote that started all this. If it's a legitimate rape, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. Now, I would like someone, some reporter, somebody, in fact, I'd like this done to everybody who uses that lame, I misspoke excuse. I want somebody to say to Aiken, Mr. Aiken, here's what you said. Would you please tell us what words you meant to say that are sufficiently close to these that these might have come out by mistake instead? Todd Aiken and the rest of the right-wing flakes, bozos, wackos, and loons spewing your, your venomous stupidity all over the body politic. You are, all of you, clowns. That's it for me. I'm out of here. I will see you next week. You just have the best week you possibly can and uh, hope to see you again. Bye.